email is essential for growing your business. Sometimes it can be a real pain to get those emails out, but today we got some powerful tips and tricks on how to create emails that people will open, people will read, and people will buy from. Welcome to Thriving Launch with Louise Congdon and Kamala Chambers, the show for heart-centered entrepreneurs who want it all. Five days a week, we bring you different segments to inspire you to live a life of freedom. We interview the leading experts in the field of business, health, and love. Be sure to check out Training Tuesdays, where we give you a clear action plan to grow your own business. Do you have a product or service that you would like to sell online? Or maybe you've been thinking about it, but you're reserved to do it because you need a website, you need complicated systems, and you need to spend money. Well, I've created a completely free course that teaches you how to use Facebook in a purely organic way. This means no ads and no money are needed. You can use Facebook completely free. So head on over to thrivinglaunch.com. Opt into my Profit from Social Media course. I'm going to teach you the free methods to using Facebook to make money today. Today's guest is Travis Sago. I'm really excited to bring him on the show because we're going to be talking about emails with him. Travis knows how to do email in a way that not too many other people are doing. In some of the future episodes, you'll see us talk with Ben Settle and Andre Chaperone where we dive into emails and Travis is going to just really hit it off for us and teach us how to do those emails. And he does it in multiple niches and does it in a way like no one else. All right, Thriving Launchers, today we're going to be talking about email mojo and we've brought on Travis. Travis, are you ready to launch? Dude, I am so ready to launch. Let's do this thing, man. So Travis, what is the best place to start when looking at email? Like it's a huge topic. I know it seems so basic. Oh, I just need to send out my monthly newsletter to my audience. But it's what so, a chore. <laughs> it's so much more <laughs> than that. And I'd love to hear about what is the best place to start and why do we start there? It's a great question. Like I say, it's kind of broad, so I'll try to uh, focus it down. I think it might be helpful if I share a metaphor that's been really helpful for my clients uh, and, and me as well. So there's a lot of different ways to approach uh, email. A lot of people kind of approach it as, um, boy, I'm like, OK, so I have livestock here and we're going to like feed them, uh, feed them stuff and then we're going to take them out to slaughter. Right. Um, those are the kind of the guys that just pitch and pitch and pitch and pitch and really kind of don't care about the people on this kind of like just just keep giving them offer, offer, offer. And then on the other side of that kind of the metaphor uh, is, boy, we have these animals that we're going to take care of, but then they almost become like pets. Right. And they. Um, and then there, there's kind of this fear of, boy, you can't slaughter your pets. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So I kind of like to step out com- of that paradigm completely. That's good because I'm not sure if I like the whole like, yeah, I'm going to slaughter this thing or I'm going to love it. Like that just that <laughs> seems so extreme. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's where we get a lot of the confusion. It's like, OK, well, you know, I want to like take care of them. But, you know, if I go out there and, you know, ask for a sale or ask for something, then I'm going to damage my relationship with them somehow. So the metaphor I like to use, uh, and it really answers a lot. I think with the metaphor, this would be able to answer a lot of uh, anybody listening to this questions about email marketing is gardening, uh, how we Uh, grow a garden. So I I focus a lot on relationships. I made a lot of my money in the relationship uh, arena using email and such. So I look at things with relationships, but also the garden, because you can't force love to grow, right? You can't go out and put your hands on your hips, wag a finger at your tomato plant and, and say, grow, darn you, grow. But we can provide it the the environment, the nutrients, the sunshine, the water, the nurturing that it that it needs, uh, and then it will kind of grow on its own. So, uh, what I like to look at is like let's pretend for a minute, uh, Lewis, that we're growing a uh, orange orchard. Just kind of really easy, something to understand, right? So we go out there, we have our orange orchard, 
And we want to go out on a, on a regular basis. I say daily. Uh, it kind of scares some people, right? Because they're like, oh, my gosh. So they, they view it as like, oh, I'm asking too much, right? But if you have an orange grove uh, that's sustaining your life, so if you want to get clients or uh, what have you or make sales and it's sustaining your life, you want to nurture that really, really frequently. Uh, so we go out there and we go on our, our nurturing, our daily nurturing route where we water and we feed and we pull out weeds. We make sure there's no varmints in the garden, right? <laughs> nothing, nothing, uh, uh, eating up the, eating up the roots. But here's the thing. So as we're going out there and nurturing, we're more than likely going to see some ripe fruit at some point, some low, what they call the low hanging fruit. Right. And so while we're out there on uh, doing our, our daily nurturing, we also want to go ahead and pick any of that low hanging fruit that's already ripe because, uh, Kamala, what's going to happen if we don't pick that fruit? Well, then it's just going to rot and drop to the ground. And Absolutely. It's going to rot. It's going to fall to the ground or rot or <laughs> um, our next or our neighbor is going to come over and, and steal it. our competition. Right. So we've spent all the time nurturing the roots and, and taking care of the garden, uh, taking care of our tree. And then if we're uh, if we're hesitant to pick the fruit that's already ripe, then our competition is going to come pick it, right? Um, or it's going to fall to the ground. So um, this kind of opens up a lot of questions where we can direct some of our focus. And one of those questions is, okay, so what do we need to nurture the uh, orange trees and the orange groves? And what about all that fruit up on top, right, that we can't get to on a regular basis? So um, I as you go about your daily nurturing uh, of your orange grove and your orange trees, you're going to see fruit up at the top of the trees you just can't get to. So that's when we're going to do a harvest, what I call a harvest, uh, where we bring out the ladders and the baskets and maybe some friends to help, right? This is what we typically call a campaign. Uh, I call it a rain maker campaign uh, where we go out and you know once a quarter once every couple months we have a kind of a promotion and we go out there and we harvest the fruit at the top of the trees um, but most of our daily sustenance will come from that daily nurturing and uh, picking of that ripe fruit so just to kind of give you put some context to this uh, even if somebody let's say we have a coach uh, I, I had a, a coach he's got a little bit bigger list now but uh, when he came to me, he had about 700 person list and he's like going crazy. Like, how can I get more clients, you know, and trying to do Facebook ads and everything, which is all great. Um, but he had a little garden right there that he wasn't nurturing. So we just started a daily nurturing campaign, picking of the fruit. And it's really typical that he'll get one or two people reaching out every day uh, to uh to talk with them. And you'll have one or two conversations a day just from that little 700 person list. So that's really incredible. I mean, I think a lot of people are scared that if they start reaching out, then they're going to lose people. So they don't use their list. <laughs> Absolutely. They don't, they don't want to lose people, but then the list just dies. And a lot of people are also afraid that if they have a 700 person email list or 200 email list, then maybe it's not useful to email them or that they're somehow failing, you know, and it really reminds me of our interview that we did with Andre Chaperone, who says, you know, small email lists are actually incredibly powerful and they're his favorite when they're highly targeted. So go ahead and continue, Travis. It's just really important to remind you, all of you, that if you have a quote unquote small email list, if you could put me in a room full of 700 people that are all interested buyers or somehow at some point said that they were interested in my stuff, that's actually a lot of people, when you think about it, a room full of 700 potential buyers. Yeah, absolutely. And and so let's, cause let's talk about the nurturing a little bit. And then let's talk about that being really specific and how we make that 700 person list seem like it's a 7,000 person list. Um, so again, I, I teach this and it could be really, really long and involved, but let me just give you the highlights of like what the orange trees need to grow, right? What do our subscribers need to grow? And most people have this, I wouldn't say they have it wrong, but there's not really focused in. So people think, okay, I need to deliver a lot, a lot of content to the to these folks. And what I usually say is like delivering a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas uh, to your next door neighbor uh, day after day is not, he's probably gonna end up hating you. He's not gonna end up liking you, right? It, we're like 
information overload. Um, so the, it's the, the, I call it a brain gasm. So the insight is what grows is the fertilizer for our, our orange trees or our subscribers, but that insight can be delivered very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, I, most of my, uh, emails that I do in my daily nurturing take me about 15 to 20 minutes a day. Uh, now it doesn't, when people get started out, it takes them a little bit longer, but all we're looking for is like that aha moment, give them a little bit di- different shift in perspective about the problems or about a symptom that they have uh, that makes them go, hmm, man, I never didn't look at it like that. That makes so much sense, right? That insight goes more to fertilize and grow and ripen the fruit than like dumping, you know, a 45 page PDF report or even, uh, you know, I'm all for webinars as long as the webinar has lots of insight into it. Right. So, uh, there's a lot of other things that kind of go into the relationship and, and the bonding. Uh, but mother nature makes it pretty easy, um, to bond because that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, you know, this is how babies fall in love with their mothers and mothers fall in love with their babies. And you might have a sister, you know, that, that uh, you end up loving, even though you uh, tear your, each other's uh, hair out almost. I just want to say something that you're saying that's really important and it's, and it's special to me. You're saying that an email doesn't have to be this long 300 page document that teaches you step by step how to crush it in this area and gives away the whole program. And that's where a lot of us get confused, right? We're thinking, gosh, I, I, I got to provide value, you know? And so then there's this whole dialogue we can have about what value is. And you're really taking us from this high, kind of complicated, challenging perspective down to the ground where you're saying, hey, like, Value can be some sort of small breakthrough. For example, it could be, hey, you know, guys, today I was realizing that I could automate my social media posts and I highly recommend you guys do it. It's it's become really simple. It's added something really fun. Here's a link to a post planner that I enjoy. Boom. That can be an email. The next email can be, you know, guys, I've been really struggling to write emails. And so what I've started doing is telling stories about how simple it can be to write an email like my conversation I had with Travis and boom, there's an email right there. There's two actually. Absolutely. You're so spot on it. My favorite tool for making this happen. I teach something called the triangle of insight um, that makes it a kind of a framework to make this happen really easy. But my favorite thing is what I call meat and potatoes metaphor. And when I mean by meat and potatoes metaphor, it's, it's metaphors that everybody understands regardless, <laughs> like the, the common, any person would understand, even if like you're in the industry and people try to get away from that. It's like, Oh, we got to make it all technical, but the meat and potatoes metaphor really, really uh, makes things work. So for example, I was working with a, uh, a client who did, it was had some, some pretty revolutionary stuff he was doing with lower back pain. And of course, it was really, really complicated. And that was part of his trouble getting it across in the emails, uh, how complicated it was. But he was telling me a story about uh, his son and everything. The other day, his his son had come uh, and the the oil was out of his car. It was all smoking, but he didn't know what was wrong with it. Right. And his basic thing that he did with the spinal column is his basic um, idea was that as you get older, you lose some of the fluid out, you lose a lot of the fluid out of your spinal column. And when you lose that fluid, then your vertebrae, and I'm, I'm not a back doctor, so uh, then your vertebrae and all the, the discs and everything start rubbing on each other, right? Uh, because kind of, it's kind of like out of oil, right? So we just took that story. It's like, uh, hey, Lewis, how are you? Uh, hope you had a great weekend. This weekend, something funny happened. Uh, I might have to say funny, but, you know, my son came over and he said, Dad, can you take a look at my car? The, like the the uh, the engine lights on and it's making this weird smell and re- weird rattle. So I go out there and, you know, first thing I do is check the oil and it's like bone dry. Well, what happens when when uh, you let the, your car run out of oil, then all the, the pistons and the rods and everything all rub together. But before you know it, you're going to blow your engine out, right? Well, your back is kind of like the same thing. You have spinal, you have spinal fluid inside. Uh, and if once that spinal fluid drains out, then your, your bones and, and vertebrae are going to rub together, causing you pain, right? So I, yeah, I've come together and it depends on how far we're going in the pitch, what we're going to do there. But there's kind of that insight, right? Nobody understand the spinal fluid there. Just kind of a real meat and potatoes metaphor. My question here for you is, do we pitch in every email? I mean, if we're emailing every day, 
do we offer our services? You know, we tell a story like you were talking about, about the, the spinal fluid and stuff. And at the end, do we do something? You know, Ben Settle's a real fan of this, Kamala. When we had Ben, he talked about pitching on every single email and essentially telling a story, being entertaining, giving a little bit of information. And then at the end, always finishing off with something, you know, like, and if you've enjoyed today's email and you want to learn more about your spine or you're having spinal issues, click here and sign up for my 12 week program or whatever it might be. Do you recommend that? Great question. Absolutely. So again, kind of the question goes back to the metaphor. That's why I'm really happy to introduce that metaphor. So if you're going out there and you're doing that daily nurturing, right, and you see a ripe orange, you want to pick it. So yes, you, pitching, I prefer picking rather than pitching, right? <laughs> so you want to you nur- you nurture and pick. Nurture and pick, right? So any of the ripe fruit out there that you want to go ahead and pick that. Now, a lot of times I'll be more smooth rather than, you know, I might. So let me start really another example out there that might be great for people. So I make a lot of my uh, money in the relationship advice niche. So kind of the same thing. I've used this metaphor uh, in relationships, right? I might be telling uh, a young woman or uh, even an older woman that, you know, you can't force love to grow, right? So I might, again, I, I I segue that into what's what's going on with my life. So, hey, how are you? Hope you're doing well. I can't stay very long. I'm helping Jeannie grow some tomatoes outside. We're growing some tomatoes out there. And it's a funny thing. You know, we can't like literally force those tomatoes to grow, right? All we can do is make sure we got, they got the sun, the light and everything. And then the tomatoes will grow all on their own, you know, as long as we're taking care of them. It's so kind of the same thing as love. So a lot of, you know, uh, but are you wondering what are the, there's actually four things that, that make love grow grow, right? If you're wanting to, wondering what those are, it depends on what you're doing. So if you're a love coach, hey, let's jump on the phone. We'll talk about those things. If you're having a hard time uh, in closeness, I use symptom stuff, then you may be missing one of these ingredients. Just jump on the phone and find out. If you're sending them to a VSL, uh, you might say that's in the VSL. If you're putting on a webinar, that's what we're going to talk about on, in the webinar, right? Um, so absolutely. So uh, nurture and pick. Um, I, I, it's very, very rare that I send emails out um, that don't have some type of way of some type of response mechanism to it. A call to action at, at the very least, right? Something because you could send out an email that teaches everything. You could send out an email that just en- entertains people and engages them. But what's the point if there's no call to action drawing them to the next thing that you want them to do? I think yes. it's a disservice to people. You are so right. That. Absolutely. You are so, so right. Now, what you do with that response mechanism, a lot of times depends on how big your garden is, right? So like with my client that had the 700 people, we want to make it super simple. Just reply back. Hey, if you want to talk about this, just reply back. Now, and I get bigger clients. Well, I had a client uh, come in and we actually, uh, because his list was bigger, it wasn't huge, but we actually filled up all of his sales guys, um, uh, using the nurture and pick. So we actually had to stop sending, but we had to get, had them fill out a, a survey first, not a survey, but, a, um, what my mind just went blank, <laughs> a strategy session for him. Right. And we had to get it really, really detailed. Right. We kind of had to throttle some of the response, right. Um, to qualify those guys more. So it depends on, you know, if you say, if you have a 10,000 person email, uh, you could literally get 50 or a hundred responses back or more. So you might have to have a little bit more of, a filtering mechanism, but you're absolutely right. You, you do want to make that, you want to pick if, if the fruit's ripe, you want to go ahead and pick it. It doesn't hurt the, the trees at all. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt the people at all. As a matter of fact, it, it, it actually helps. I'd like to hear from you about how to get people to open your emails. Now the subject line is so important and there's, there are so many different techniques. I would love to hear from you what you use to get people to open emails. I am so happy you asked, Kamala. Um, I have a completely different take uh, on this. I really don't care so much what the open rate is. What I care about is the response out the other end. Um, and, and this is kind of how I convert uh, as well, like 20, 25 percent. Uh, of the entire email list over time. So uh, let me use another metaphor. The the way most people go about like open rates, uh, let's say we're selling a hammer and they'll say, hey, uh, have you bought our hammer yet, right? Or they'll come up with some subject line like uh, that tries to get everybody to open, like, like, hey, or hey, this is personal, right? Personal about hammers, really? Come on. Um, But 
so they'll, they'll, they'll go into the email and say, hey, have you bought our hammer yet? Our hammer is really awesome. Uh, our hammer is better because we use an alloy head that never rusts, right? All these other hammers use uh, metal that will rust, right? And then the next day they might come along and say, uh, hey, um, are, is your hammer too heavy, right? I say, hey, you should really use our hammer. We use an alloy. It's lighter, uh, so on and so forth. Well, you, you can only get so many of those emails, right, before you get bored as hell with them. You're like, ugh, <laughs> right? And the marketer runs out of uh, things to say, right? And then so, therefore, the, the opening rates go down because they're trying to get everybody to open, uh, and it, it's, not, it's not relevant. Um, and they run out of things to say, and people get bored with it. But there's another way. Here's how I sell hammers is I figure out what they're doing with their with with the hammers or what problems they're trying to solve with those hammers. And then I write really specifically to that. So I might say, uh, hey, Lewis, are you building the birdhouse this weekend? That might be my subject line. Right. Nothing to do with hammers. Now, it may uh, again, I don't want to be completely off topic here, but uh, and Lewis is like, holy crap, how did he know? How did he know I'm going to build a birdhouse with this thing, right? So I may not get like the biggest open rate on that, but the people that are open, they're like, holy crap, right? <laughs> and so they they will open that. And it's like, and so I'll talk to Lewis, hey, Lewis, if you're building a birdhouse this weekend, uh, you know, you need kind of a special type of hammer because you have really, really fragile wood and you'll end up splitting that wood. So you'll want our, our little three ounce hammer, but you'll talk about building that birdhouse. My very next email may be, hey, Lewis, are you uh, remodeling a bathroom? He's like, oh my God, you know? Now, now if Lewis was- How did Travis bird, know? Yeah, if, if you, especially if you were like building a, a birdhouse and then remodeling it, but you'd be like, oh my God, this dude's amazing, right? But, <laughs> but if you weren't building that birdhouse, you won't open that email. But if you were building, if you're remodeling a bathroom, you might- Say holy crap, right? You're gonna open that with much, <laughs> with much more uh, enthusiasm, right? And so our open rates may be less, but our sales or our response at the other side is is way higher. But we can do literally do this for thousands of days, right? Because how many things can you do with a hammer? Yeah, this is this is amazing, and I love that you're really gearing it towards solving the problem, and this is something we've talked about a lot. Like, what is the problem that you're trying to solve for people? And in that even applies to the emails and the email subject lines. I'd love to hear from you something that there's been a mix of controversy on. Do you include someone's name in the email? It, it sounds like you do. Hey, Lewis, uh, you know, are you building the birdhouse? You know, because if someone puts in their name, maybe they use a false name, you know, or maybe maybe they use their email address for their name. And so what what do you do in that situation? Do you always include their name at the top of the email? Hey, Lewis, or do you actually uh, just leave that out altogether like some email marketers do? It's, it's a great question, Kamala. Um I don't really think, I think I have this saying, it's the cake and the icing. I really think that's more of an icing thing, um, more than the cake. Uh, if I have the name, I will use it. If it make, if it makes sense, if I don't have the name, I won't use it. Um, so it, and it depends on the niche too. If they're a bunch of internet marketers, they're really, they know what, they're hip to what's going on. But like in the dating space, uh, for some of the women that, that I talk to, it's like, it's really nice to, to get that name. I'll even use like city uh, the city or stuff, you know, and I'll just get really even more specific there. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I have it and it makes sense, but it's really more of a, I don't like put a whole lot of, of credence on that either way. You uh, said something that I really liked and, and not to cut you off there. Sorry. Cause I, I know that you were saying something that, you know, Kamala and I have, I, we've looked at and whether or not to use the name. And I also want to, jump into something else. Cause you know, like you said, that's a personal preference thing. Maybe the niche, it can make a difference, but it's, it's not the cake. It's not the most important piece, but what you said earlier is the most important piece. And it's something that's really making me think about how I email and a small shift that I can make, uh, you know, and I'm doing okay with emails. I'm getting better. I, I, I've, I've gotten into it and into the daily practice. And it's a lot of fun and I'm improving a lot. And one of the things that you just gave to me is, 
entering that conversation, you know, I don't know if it was Dan Kennedy who originally said it or who originally said this, but you know, the best type of copy, the best type of marketing is where we can enter the conversation, enter the life of that person. And it's, it's, it's like we actually are there with them. So if they're building a birdhouse and we send them that email about the birdhouse, they're going, Oh, cool. You know me, you know, and this is something that I need to do uh, more in my emails is start conversing with a specific person and creating a headline for that specific person and focus more on trying to get that person to have a response rate instead of a big open rate by everybody. Absolutely. And I would like to add to that if I may, because it's a really, really good point. And one of the, like, the things I can really give value to your folks listening to this or even you um, is a different take on. So a lot of people like they're, they're, part of the reason why they don't uh, use email or go out into their garden as much as they feel like they have to be a really great writer, right? They have to feel like they have to be a really great gardener where, you know, going back to the mail order days uh, where they had to pay for names and email addresses, they realized that 60% of the sales success was in the list that they rented. 30% was the offer that they made to the list and only 10% uh, was the words that they used. So now, it would, it would be foolhardy for me to say that the words don't matter. That's like saying that because your heart only takes up 10 percent of your body, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, but the words really are more of to give emotional payoff. Uh, so they open the other emails, but it has very little to do with the actual sales success. Um, and so let me give you uh, uh, your readers a tip on that. Um, a lot of people, a lot of marketers are good about talking about pain and problems, but you can step it up a level. So let me give you an, an example, a recent email that, that I've, I sent. So one of the problems that my women, that I call my women, so <laughs> uh, that they, that they have when they're in a relationship, it's kind of feeling like the passion is dying. The passion is fizzling away. So I could write, if I'm not having the best brain day, I might just start out, you know, the subject line is the passion fading in your relationship. Right. But that's very common, right? And it doesn't take a whole lot of, of uh, you know, everybody's saying that. But what's different and what I found it works really, really well and takes a lot of uh, lifting of, off the writing is figuring out what symptoms do they have? What symptoms did, are they seeing in their life? Are they feeling in their life? Are they hearing? What is he saying? What's happening in their life? And starting out with the symptoms. So here's a Here's an example. So, and I kind of took it to another level, but one of the symptoms of uh, passion fading is maybe they're not getting passionate kisses anymore, right? Um, they get those little pecks on the cheek, right? Uh, and so I kind of label them. Kamala does not let me get away with oh, that. Oh, no way. I do not like those kisses. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I even took it to another level. Now, this is kind of words, but this is kind of like labeling the problem better than they can label it. Right. So I, my subject line was if he kisses you like your grandpa and that was like, Ooh, wow. and, and so boom, so open it and it started up. When was the last time he took your, your head in both hands and kissed you for longer than two seconds. And so then I start out my, my pen name's T dub. Uh, Hey, it's T-Dub here. And I, I roll into a story about when I was a kid. This is kind of like the bonding, right, that, that I do. I said, uh, I remember when my mom sat me down, we watched Gone with the Wind. I was about eight years old. And I couldn't understand why Scarlett and Rhett kissed for so long. It was just like weird to me. I'm like, Mom, why do they do that, right? That's so gross. And and she tried to explain it to me as best as she could, you know, to an eight-year-old. But I labeled that movie star kisses. I was like, that's why movie stars kiss because nobody else really kisses like that, right? But now I've got something else that's very, very clear, right? So then, you know, so I've already like hit them with the symptom, right? Which is the, what I call hell Island, which is grandpa kisses. And so I set a gap in there with movie star, go from grandpa kisses to movie star kisses, right? And here's what's uh, involved to go from grandpa kisses to movie star kisses. Sounds so. hot. That's fantastic. I love it. Well, thank you. So uh, starting with the symptom is way more powerful. Like, yeah, I'll have to admit some days I'm just brain dead and I'll just, uh, you know, go with a problem, but it's way more powerful, uh, to go with the symptom. Like one of my big ones is why does it take him so long to test, to text back? 
because that's like a big frustration, right? And boy, I get a huge, not only a, a huge open rate, but I get a very engaged open rate, right? Now, if they're not having that problem, they're just not going to open. And that's totally cool with me, right? Um, but it's, it's being very, again, it's not about selling hammers. It's about selling what's the problems they have in their life because they don't have the hammer. Uh, what's the symptoms? What's popping up? So uh, I think that will really help folks. And that's kind of like how I just, you know, convert over like six months or a year, uh, 20, 25% of the entire lists um, is just by being, what's the symptom? What's it on a, a single product, right? And then, <laughs> um, and then just being really symptomatic with that. You know what? It's like you're in women's heads. I've heard so <laughs> many times my single friends, he never texts back. Why is it he texting back? And they get obsessed with their phones and women who are in relationships. If I let Luis get away with that, he'd give me grandpa kisses, but I don't let him get away with it. So, <laughs> so it's just this is this is what the essence of what you're saying is to understand people on the deepest level. What are they really experiencing and it allows you to create the sense of empathy, the sense of connection with people. And you're creating that sense of connection in the subject line of the email. This has been really fantastic having you on the show, talking about how to create powerful emails. Thank you so much for the metaphors you shared with us today. We're going to make sure to include how to get in touch with you, all your resources at thrivinglaunch.com, uh, Thriving Launchers. I want to see your emails. Uh, please stay engaged. Let us know how your emails are going. And we'll have resources for uh, Travis. We'll have resources for some hot email resources that we think you should be checking out if you want to improve the open rates. You want to listen to some other episodes on this kind of stuff. Head on over to thrivinglaunch.com. Travis, been a real pleasure to have you on the show today. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. I had a great, great time. You've been listening to the Thriving Launch Podcast. For books and resources related to today's episode, make sure to head over to thrivinglaunch.com. We'll see you there. Be sure to tune into our next episode where we're going to talk about the power of forgiveness, its ability to help us heal, have more power and abundance in our life. And for that, we've brought on Dr. Sean Duperin. 